Super Double Dragon, the ultimate in Super Nintendo martial arts action. All new weapons, characters, and street fighting action. Super Double Dragon for Super NES, the action keeps coming. The 16-bit era really saw the rise in popularity of the side-scrolling beat-em-up genre. Prior to the 16-bit era, these games were mainly relegated to the arcades due to limitations on home hardware. The limitations on the number of moving objects on screen were probably the biggest hurdle to overcome on 8-bit systems, because having two players face off against a bunch of enemies on screens would have produced an annoying amount of screen flicker or slowed the system down to a crawl. But in the era of 16-bit hardware, these games would flourish in the home environment, prompting game developers not only to port arcade games to the home systems, but also develop games from the ground up on this hardware. Many of these games will follow a similar playstyle of move to the left or right of the screen while punching, kicking, or throwing weapons at a seemingly endless barrage of enemies and then facing off against a final boss at the end of a stage or game. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples of side-scrolling beat-em-up games on the Super Nintendo. We've already talked a little bit about the first Final Fight because it was one of the earliest games released for the Super Nintendo. And while that game was a port of the 1989 arcade game, Final Fight 2 was developed specifically for the Super Nintendo as a direct follow-up to the original. And possibly as a result of being built specifically for the Super Nintendo, this game was able to take advantage of two-player simultaneous co-op play. You are given the choice between three different characters to play as, including one from the first game. As each character has their own unique fighting technique, which one you choose depends on how you will play the game. And in terms of gameplay, this game is strikingly similar to the original. You start out with two main actions, jump or attack. However, if you press them both together, you can perform a special move or you can map it to a third button. You will fight your way through each stage, facing off against a plethora of enemies until you face off against a boss at the end of each stage. You can also pick up power-ups and other weapons to fight temporarily with, and the game will end if you can make it through the game's six stages. Upon this game's release, it received more of a mediocre reception than I was expecting when I looked up reviews, receiving between a 7 and 8 out of 10. Some of the main criticisms of this game is that the control scheme is just way too simple, and with more advanced fighting games hitting the scene around this time, the critics were noting that this gameplay style was a bit dated even when it released. I believe that reviews have actually improved on this game since its initial release, as I would give it around a 9 out of 10. True, it's nothing really too special, but it is a very competent game and will provide a fun play experience. Again, I think that two players may be better than one, but I still had fun with it either way. Final Fight 2's success led to another sequel being produced, hitting store shelves in North America in 1996. This game was again only available for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System when it released, and again this game is very similar to its predecessor. In this game you can choose between four different characters. Again you can play along with a second player, but if you don't have any friends, the computer will play along with you if you select it to. Again, each character has their own unique set of fighting styles, so it will again change how you play the game based on which character you select. However, each character also has some new abilities that were not available in previous entries. The player now has a quick dash move, and can perform dashing attacks and dashing jumps, as well as grab enemies from behind and perform holding and throwing attacks. You also now have access to command-based special techniques similar to the game Street Fighter, including a new super move that is much like the combos featured in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. You can also pick up power-ups and weapons like in the previous game, but in this game the bit of a twist is each character has their own preferred weapon, and when you pick up their preferred weapon, you will then have access to a unique combo attack exclusive to the character. Again, there are a total of six stages in the game, each with a boss character at the end. Defeating them all takes you to the end of the game. The game's ending will change depending on the character you select and the path taken to the end of the game, as well as the difficulty setting. Upon release, this game was reviewed much lower than the previous two entries, receiving around a 4 to 6 out of 10. 
Reviewers praised the strong art style and graphics, as well as the branching stages, but they were very critical of the repetitive gameplay, saying that you'll probably get bored of it before you reach the end. Again, I feel like this game is better reviewed today, as people look back on it as being the end of a great trilogy on the Super Nintendo. Personally, out of the series, I prefer 2 or 3, with probably my preference being towards this third one due to the variety of characters you can play as. But I also get the perspective where if you play all three of these right in a row like I did, you can get very bored of it by the third entry. I feel this game probably deserves more of a 7 or 8 out of 10. <laughs> Aliens vs. Predator on the Super Nintendo is not quite what I expected having played the PC version from the mid-90s, with this one being a side-scrolling beat-em-up by Activision. And I tried to find something that I was either particularly enjoying or critical of in this game, but I really couldn't find anything. This game is just mediocre right across the board. I've seen other reviews mention that this game is supposed to be like Final Fight, but it doesn't really work as well in execution, and that's as best as I can describe it. The music is forgettable and very repetitive, the graphics look kind of muddied, and the controls aren't really necessarily broken, but I do feel like everything is either just a little too slow or a little delayed. I don't know how to describe that. It's fine, and I suspect that people who are fans of these franchises will enjoy it a bit more, but it's not really something that I was expecting. I give it around a 5 or a 6 out of 10. Hey, do you guys remember that insanely difficult NES game that everyone always wants to force people to play and then they laugh when they get to the speeder bike section? Well, welcome to that on the Super Nintendo. This is Battletoads in Battle Maniacs. It was developed by Rare and published by Trade West here in North America, but it was published by Nintendo in other parts of the world. This is an action platform beat-em-up game that takes place inside of a place called the Gamescape, which is a fictional virtual world where computer-generated villains run amok. The player can control one of the two Battletoads on screen, depending on which controller they have plugged in, and thankfully have a longer health meter than that of previous games. Unlike in previous Battletoad games as well, each character has their own combo and special move. The game is split up into six different stages, each with their own special style of gameplay. And even though each stage is a little bit unique in terms of their gameplay style, each of these actually feel like an enhanced version from their counterparts on the first Battletoads game. Which means, you guessed it, the speeder bikes are back. There's not really too much else I have to say about this game. It is very well made and visually appealing. I think the art style again holds up because of those cartoony graphics. And having the characters animate into larger fists, and when their special moves go in, they actually transform into different objects. Those are a nice touch. And looking at modern and retro reviews, I see a lot of the same thing, saying that the very gameplay and music is good. But if you didn't hear me say the name Battletoads in the beginning, I'm going to say it again because it is definitely a difficult Battletoads game. I'm not quite sure how this ranks in comparison to the original, as that one's pretty hardcore. The difficulty in this game isn't quite as bad, but I really feel like it's splitting hairs, because I still had some throw my controller across the room moments with this game. I'd be closer to give it a 6 out of 10, but I've seen modern and retro reviews kind of give it more of an 8 out of 10, so if you're really a fan of that classic early 90s difficulty in these games, I would say go for it. Super Double Dragon, released in Japan as Return of Double Dragon, Sleeping Dragon Has Awoken, is a side-scrolling beat-em-up released for the Super Nintendo in 1992. It was published by Trade West in North America, but its original developer was Technos Japan. 
Despite the numbers being dropped, this is actually the fourth game in the Double Dragon series, having been developed right after Double Dragon 3 for the NES. But I personally find Super Double Dragon to be a classic beat-em-up for the Super Nintendo, featuring smooth and fluid gameplay with intuitive controls and a variety of moves to master. In addition to punch, kick, and jump, the player now has a guard button for blocking attacks. Timing your guard correctly can not only mean blocking the attack, but can also put the enemy in an arm grab which prevents them from attacking and leaves them vulnerable to multiple blows. The game has a solid difficulty progression system across its seven stages, which offers a good challenge for players of all skill levels. I find the graphics of this game to be particularly appealing and very well done, with a great representation of the characters and environments, especially compared to the Nintendo Entertainment System. Although the musical score wasn't something that I noticed very much in this game, I think that's actually a benefit to the fact that these tracks just naturally accompany the action on screen. And the fact that this game offers cooperative play, not something that all Double Dragon games have done on the Nintendo systems, I think you really can't go wrong with this one. It's fun, I had a good time with it, and I would definitely recommend it for those who are fans of the beat-em-up genre. And now that we've covered each one individually, how about we cover the game where Battletoads and Double Dragon team up in the Ultimate Team? That's right, Rare actually developed this game alongside Battle Maniacs. There was a version also published for the Nintendo Entertainment System, which released the same month as Battle Maniacs on the Super Nintendo, but this crossover came over to the Super Nintendo that December. This game brings together the popular franchises of Battletoads and Double Dragon, combining elements from both series into one unique experience. You get to choose as one of the five playable characters, three Battletoads and two Double Dragons. Each one has their own unique abilities and moves. The game takes place across a variety of different levels, including side-scrolling beat-em-up stages, vehicle-based levels, and platforming segments. Again, I think the level design is well done here, offering a good mix of challenge and variety. The graphics are also colorful and vibrant, and have a strong art style that I think holds up well today. And again, I think the soundtrack is definitely well-fitting to the game. Again, if you want to have a friend team up, I definitely recommend the co-op mode. And overall, if you're either a fan of Battletoads or Double Dragons, or just beat-em-ups in general, I would definitely recommend checking out this game. This game received mixed reviews when it first was released. However, as this game has gotten older, it has gotten better reviews. Uh, did you hear that? I finally know how to pronounce this. It's Jalico. Anywho, Brawl Brothers was developed and published by Jalico in 1993 for the Super Nintendo. In this game, you get to pick one of two brothers who have set out to save their kidnapped sister from a group of criminals. The game, in my opinion, plays very similarly to Final Fight, where you walk across the screen and fight bad guys for several stages. You can pick up weapons and power-ups along the way, and a special angry mode gives injured fighters a burst of energy. I mean, overall, I think the game plays decent, it's well presented, and is fairly typical of some of the other side-scrolling beat-em-up games of this era. But there's not really too much that makes it stick out from a crowd, in my opinion, except for the fact that this is the game they decided to put onto the Nintendo Switch Online service as one of the gaming classics, and I think that there are better games they could have used, but probably couldn't get the license to, at least cheaply enough to put it on a subscription service. Overall, this game received middle-of-the-road reviews around 7.5 to 8 out of 10, and I would say it ranks at about a 7 out of 10 for me as well. You can't really go wrong with this one, but I would say it's more of a game that would make a great addition to a beat-em-up collection, as opposed to being the only beat-em-up game you own on the system. Avengers. Captain America and the Avengers is a port of the arcade game that was developed by Data East, this time licensed to Mindscape for publication on the Super Nintendo. In this game, you'll take the role of one of four Avengers, including Iron Man, Captain America, Hawkeye, and Vision, and you will navigate them through several stages, taking out henchmen of the Red Skull until you eventually face off against the Red Skull himself. 
I think what drew me into this game the most was the licensed branding of Marvel, and anything pre-Disney is something that kind of intrigues me, just because I want to see what was the likeness of these characters before the entire MCU standardization. Overall, it's a fairly typical side-scrolling beat-em-up that I think will hold your interest if you're a Marvel fan for the most part, but if you're not, this game can get tedious and repetitive pretty quickly. Keeping in mind that this game was designed to eat your quarters in the arcade, and they didn't really stray away from that design in the home ports, it should let you know that a lot of people will enjoy playing this game a few times. It's not as competent as some of the other ones we've already covered in this video, I'd say it's around a 6 out of 10 for me, but I've seen other reviews of this game be a lot more critical, giving it more of a 3 out of 10. So that will lead me to recommend this game only to fans of side-scrolling beat-em-ups as well as the Marvel franchises. The game Cliffhanger is a beat-em-up slash platform video game that was released in 1993 based upon the summer blockbuster film that was Cliffhanger of that same year. The game for me is similar to how the movie is for me. It's mostly forgettable, unfortunately. The game starts off giving you a bit of backstory that the movie would normally give you about how you ended up in this situation, but once you get into the game, you're gonna find out that all you do is keep punching enemies until you can move on to the next stage, and there's really not much else going on. I mean, you can also attack enemies with a knife or a gun, but it doesn't really make the gameplay any better. This game has the distinction of winning Electronic Gaming Monthly's Worst Movie to Game of 1994, with one reviewer calling it a truly disgusting piece of software. So with reviews like that, I just had to try it out for myself to see if it was truly as bad as all that. And I'm gonna have to agree, they weren't too far off. I would give this around a 2 out of 10, although I've seen some reviews rank this to as high as 4.75 out of 10. You should really give this one a pass, unless you really enjoy playing very poorly made games. Cutthroat Island came out in 1995 and is based on the film of the same name as well, it was developed by Software Creations and published by Acclaim, and what's that I see? Is that an LGN logo? I believe it is. The words mediocre and subpar come to mind when playing this game. Another definite skip, and I'm not going to spend a lot more time on this. The next game on my list is The Death and Return of Superman, released by Sunsoft for the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis in 1994. This game is based on the Death of Superman comic book storyline by DC Comics, and features many of the characters from the comics including Superman himself, Superboy, Steel, Cyborg Superman, The Eradicator, and, of course, Doomsday. The characters have a standard set of controls you would expect from almost any other beat-em-up game, but I think the biggest draw for this one again is the license, this time being Superman. I give this game around a 6 out of 10, as I did enjoy this game to an extent, but I really do think that the people who are going to enjoy this the most are fans of Superman, and of course, fans of side-scrolling beat-em-ups. Sadly, this is only a single-player experience. I think maybe two-player would have helped out a little bit, but I don't think that should stop you from wanting to go through this game on your own. The King of Dragons originally hit arcades in 1991, but was ported to the Super Nintendo by Capcom in 1994. In this game, you will control characters through the Kingdom of Malice to defeat monsters led by the evil dragon Gildas. Unlike some other games in this genre, as you advance through the levels, you will also level up your character throughout the game, which really gives this game more of a role-playing vibe than some of the other beat-em-ups. 
The points you score for killing monsters and picking up gold count towards your experience, and the character can gain levels at regular intervals, which will increase their health bar, as well as increase their stats for attack, attack range, and other attributes. The game's levels are short as this was more developed to be in an arcade, but overall the time to complete this game is no more or less than the typical beat-em-up game. It is nice to see that this game does include a two-player cooperative mode, which is a much welcome feature. I would give this game around a 7 out of 10. As for me, I think it was a bit more entertaining than some of the average beat-em-ups on this system. But just to let you know, I've seen review source of this game go from 8 out of 10 all the way down to 3 out of 10. <laughs> Knights of the Round was also an arcade game released by Capcom in 1991, hitting the Super Nintendo in 1994. This game's plot follows the legend of King Arthur and basically puts it into a side-scrolling beat-em-up game. To be honest, I really enjoyed this one. I had a hard time putting it down once I started it. I'm not quite sure if it's the subject matter or the fact that Capcom really had a good idea on what a game in this genre should be like, but I definitely enjoyed my playthrough of it, getting through the game's seven stages almost in one sitting. Again, your character will level up throughout your gameplay, and that style of progressing the gameplay really kept me into it, wanting to upgrade my character as far as I could, and I really didn't like starting back over from the beginning when I would turn off the system and lose my progress. My first time playing it was to include it in this review, and I am definitely glad it was recommended to me because I would say this is around an 8 or a 9 out of 10 for me. Definitely one of the better beat-em-ups on this platform, and one I would recommend for your collection, although it is kind of pricey these days. Well, we're almost at video length already, and there are still several more games to cover, so I am going to split this off into a part two. But in the games I've covered so far, I definitely am a fan of the Final Fight series, as well as other Capcom beat-em-up games on the system, such as Knights of the Round and King of the Dragons. Super Double Dragon is also another favorite of mine on this system, and one I rented frequently back in the day. But if the only game you've played is Brawl Brothers because it was available on the Nintendo Switch Online service, I would say you're definitely missing out on some other classic titles. But as we wrap things up for this video, please leave a comment below about any of the games I've talked about today, and if I've covered any of your favorites, and also let me know what you thought of the games covered so far. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A special thanks to those Patreons you see on screen. Also, if you like what you see, please remember to leave a like and click that subscribe button on your way out. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.